tonight on 16 by 9 young Canadians going overseas anyone who will kill the same enemy as mine is my brother to train as terrorists they're looking for an individual that is committed to their extreme view of Islam brainwashed to fight and even die as martyrs they encourage them to become suicide bombers and to win this race you have to run two marathons, pull a log, climb a volcano, careful, my chicken to kiss. Oh, yeah. and carry a chicken. This is going to be a race to remember. Here's Carolyn Jarvis. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. You may never have heard the name Al-Shabaab, but Canadian intelligence officials have worried about its connection to homegrown terrorism. Canada's top spy says Al-Shabaab is one of a number of groups actively recruiting young men here to fight and die on foreign soil. So far, Al-Shabaab has left its mark mostly in Somalia, but there is growing concern Canadian recruits will bring their ideology and their weapons back home. Lama Nicola has more in this 16 by 9 investigation. It's an image of bravado and brotherhood. Their purpose, they say, is to crush anyone that doesn't share their ideology. This is Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Somalia. Al-Shabaab, Arabic for the youth, has been very successful at recruiting young men from around the world, including Canada. For me, and when I was in that war 2007, I could care less if it was Osama or the devil himself who came far alongside me. Anyone who will kill the same enemy as mine is my brother. This Canadian man says he once took up a gun alongside Al-Shabaab, not because of a shared ideology, but for something closer to his heart, Somalia. It is heaven on earth. You have the beaches, you have the rivers, the smell and the scent of the rain. That will win your heart. It is just amazing. Mohammed Abdullahi Mohammed left Somalia at 14, moved to an area in Toronto dubbed Little Mogadishu. In 2004, he returned to Somalia, where he met the so-called Taliban of that country. Shabaab were a minority, they were just rising up, but they used that nationalism to gather support from the young. Mohammed says he was working for the Somali government, but when war broke out with Ethiopia, Somalia's historic enemy, he says he joined Al-Shabaab. They said, we'll give you the right and opportunity to fight back and free your country. From cushy government job to a terrorist training camp in an old graveyard, Mohammed says he learned a lot about Al-Shabaab. So was it literally just putting a gun in your hand? They had an old Italian graveyard where they, it's called the civilian self-defense courses. They were trying to breach a lot of young kids who first they recruit in the name of nationalism, then they brainwashing. Brainwashing, he says, included extreme Islamic ideology. He says he didn't care for the doctrine, but did learn to fight and spill blood, Shabab style. I fought the Ethiopians. I don't know who I killed because we were shooting each other. It's like a thousand, a hundred yards, two hundred yards, he's shooting. The war ended and Mohammed returned to Canada with new skills to fight pitch battle and insight into Al Shabab, its goals, the ones it still fights for today. To have two billion and a half Muslims under one rule, they believe that to the core, and they will die until the end of the world. Canada's spy agency, CSIS, says dozens of Canadians have joined that cause. In recent years, eight young Torontonians disappeared, believed to have joined Al-Shabaab. But Al-Shabaab isn't the only group recruiting. Christos Katsarubis and Ali Medlaj of London, Ontario, were recently linked to this Al-Qaeda terrorist attack in Algeria. 
and CISA says it is tracking the activities of more Canadians fighting with Al-Qaeda. There is a body of knowledge that there have been Canadians participating in the global, either directly in terrorist activity or in support of that activity abroad. Alan McDougall was with CSIS and worked extensively in Africa and the Middle East. He says groups like Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda are recruiting foreign fighters. Primarily they're looking for an individual that is committed to their extreme view of Islam, the, the Al-Qaeda narrative, if you will. The Al-Qaeda narrative, he says, calls for violent jihad and a doctrine which punishes with amputations, stonings and death. And Al-Shabaab is looking for people willing to carry out that vicious jihad. The type of individuals, generally they're males, generally a younger male, anywhere from the age of 15 through to 30. That would be their primary recruiting ground. Al-Shabaab is said to be one of the most successful terrorist organizations at recruiting foreign fighters. They use Facebook, Twitter and YouTube to post propaganda videos like this. From Mogadishu first stop at ease, gonna knock America down to her knees. Al-Qaeda even has an online English language magazine called Inspire that looks like a typical glossy but has articles on things like how to carry out an ambush or torch a parked car. They purposefully adopted a much more um, uh, public front. They very effectively utilize individuals that knew how to use the internet, reach out throughout the world in order to contact people. Lorne Dawson teaches at the University of Waterloo. He says Al-Shabaab has recruited online using what he calls entrepreneurs. Dawson says these entrepreneurs sell Al-Shabaab's cause to would-be recruits. So for them, Al-Shabaab's obvious creds, right, it's credential as a fighting group, an organized fighting group that uh, you know, is very attractive to them. He says Al-Shabaab's image is younger, brazen, more radical, and it's selling a cause to fight for. They're usually converting initially, not so much, of course, to become terrorists. They're converting to become what they think of as, as, as reform Muslims. You have a sense that you are going to save the world, that you are being pure, and that you can help other to become people to become pure. That's the lure. Muhammad Abdullahi Muhammad says he's seen this pattern of recruitment in his own community. They want young, Muslim, educated. They don't want you if you're a drug dealer. They don't want you if you're a gang member. They don't want you. But if you are educated and alienated and frustrated, that's when they want you. Adventure, brotherhood, a sense of a superior ideology worth fighting for, and even dying for. It is portrayed to me in a way that here are these warriors from the good old days. I buy it hook, line, and sinker. And this is the exact same narrative that is being perpetuated amongst these youth, Muslim youth today. Mubin Sheikh says he was once one of those Muslim youth. He now studies and lectures on radicalization and terrorism. Isolation and alienation is a really a, an attractive um, mechanism by which kids can become radicalized because they're already cast out and anything that gives them a chance to feel that they have power, they will take it. Sheikh says he managed to outgrow his own radical ways of thinking before it was too late and wonders if his life could have taken a much darker turn. It's possible that at that time if, if a, a professional recruiter had made his way to me or I had made my way to him, who knows what I could have been convinced to do, right? I was at such a vulnerable point. But as far as I knew, I wasn't going to blow people up or kill people or not here anyway I was ready to do it elsewhere next one of America's most wanted on the run but tweeting I think he should be pursued and prosecuted Over
before morning coffee, Clinton Watts is checking his Twitter account to see what one of America's most wanted terrorists would like for lunch. And here's one where I asked him what he wanted for lunch, you know, and he said he wanted hot wings. Watts is a former FBI agent who blogs about counterterrorism and national security. He says it's his hobby to watch Abu M. Abu M is the Twitter handle for Omar Hamami. Omar was born in Alabama to a Southern Baptist mother and Syrian father. As a teen, he began to explore his Muslim roots. He later moved to Toronto before heading to Somalia to join Al Shabaab in 2006. His nom de guerre became Al Amriki, meaning the American. He's joined a uh, you know, a foreign terrorist organization uh, designated by the United States. He, he claims in his own biography that he has attacked aid forces. He claims to have killed people. We're going to get the reward of riba. Watts says Omar, a self-described mujahid or religious fighter, has also openly called for attacking Western targets. He stood in a podium on, you know, essentially a ceremony honoring Osama bin Laden and spoke a very specific rhetoric about why, you know, the West needs to be targeted. Omar is alleged to have served as an Al-Shabaab commander, recruiter and propagandist and created several online videos where he sounds off about various jihadi ideologies. Bomb by bomb, blast by blast, only gonna bring back the glorious past. A Twitter account, these videos, Omar has not kept a low profile or hidden his agenda. In November 2012, the FBI added Omar to its top 10 most wanted terrorist list. He is wanted for terrorism violations dating back to 2006. Clinton Watts says Omar should be brought to justice. He's violated U.S. law and uh, I think he should be pursued and prosecuted. The FBI isn't the only organization hunting Omar these days. When he openly criticized Al-Shabaab's ill-treatment of foreign fighters, Al-Shabaab kicked him out. Shabaab had posted a message in the middle of December that said, uh, Omar Hamami is not part of Shabaab anymore. He's a narcissist. Uh, you know, he doesn't represent our views, basically distancing themselves. It seems Al-Shabaab wants Omar dead. Once again, Abu M reached out online for help. I record this message today because I feel that my life may be endangered by Harak Shabab Mujahideen. I think the first week of January, then Hamami comes up and says, Shabab has come to me and said, I need to surrender my weapon in two weeks, which he takes to mean, I've got two weeks to turn over my weapon and then they're probably going to kill me. But he didn't turn himself in or give up his gun. Instead, he went underground and then posted a second plea for help. He then posted another document in Arabic this time and a video, basically a last prayer, calling for, you know, people to protect him and, and save his life. So the kid from Alabama turned Al-Shabaab's poster boy for foreign recruits seems to be in a bind, wanted by the FBI and Al-Shabaab. And in March, the U.S. State Department put a $5 million bounty on Omar's head. So does that serve as a cautionary tale to others? Absolutely. These stories really undermine the sort of idealistic vision of what it's going to be like to participate in this jihad when they go to these locations. For Omar, the story ended in exile. But his isn't the only story or the only ending. According to reports, many Canadians and Americans have disappeared, believed to have joined Al-Shabaab. Many of those recruits never returned home. I think that's why some of them end up being suicide bombers, quite, quite honestly. You know, if you're a Shabaab member, you're picking up a lot of these Western recruits. They're not very effective fighters. They're kind of a pain to deal with, and they're high needs. I would probably imagine they encourage them to become suicide bombers, which is great for propaganda value and is a way to sort of get them off your books if you're a, a local Shabaab member. Back in Canada, 16 by 9 met a man who knows what it's like to lose a family member to Al-Shabaab's cause. When I saw, you know, his name uh, and, uh, through the media and what he did back home, I mean, I was shocked because the last time I remember he was in Minnesota. Farah Awasman's nephew, Sherwa Ahmed, was a 27-year-old from Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
In October 2008, Sherwa drove a car packed with explosives into a government building in Somalia, killing more than 20 people. It was shock because that's the first time we knew uh, or we become you know, uh, aware the number of young people from the diaspora who went back home and joined Al-Shabaab. Not only that, but also in, um, the damage and the casualties of innocent lives. 20 innocent lives taken by an American foreign fighter recruited by Al-Shabaab. One of the uh, victims who died in that suicide mission was a Somali Canadian from Ottawa. And I happen to know that man. He was on vacation, he's a father. He happened, you know, to walk in that particular uh, government building in Hargeisa, and he died. For what reason? I mean, that's, that's, that's the question that many people have no answer for. And yet, according to this 2011 Homeland Security report, 40 more young men left their American homes to join Al-Shabaab. The report states, so many Americans have joined that at least 15 of them have been killed fighting with Shabab, as well as three Canadians. At least 21 or more American Shabab members overseas remain unaccounted for and pose a direct threat to the U.S. homeland. The flood of recruits has Canadian security agencies on high alert. In January, Canada's top spy, Richard Fadden of CSIS, reported to the Senate's National Security Committee. The radicalization of Canadians continues to be of concern to the service. CSIS is currently aware of dozens of Canadians, many in their early 20s, who have uh, traveled or attempted to travel overseas to engage in terrorism-related activities in recent years. Canadian law enforcement has tried to stop recruits before they get overseas. Last spring, university student Mohamed Hersey was arrested at Pearson International Airport. Police allege he was leaving Canada to join Al-Shabaab. Mubin Sheikh, a reformed radical and now scholar of radicalization and terrorism, says there is a bigger concern than Canadians leaving. Canadians coming home. This is a major threat because especially those people who go with real know-how. We're not talking about kids playing paintball in the woods. We're talking about kids who have joined a paramilitary organization with real know-how. And so it's a very big difference. But while Mubin walked to the edge of radicalization and retreated before he got in too deep, it seems Omar has hit rock bottom and Al-Shabaab has found a new American. He was known as the Al Amriki, the American, but now there's a new Al Amriki. As sort of the replacement American to sort of fill, you know, Omar's shoes as the American face that's pro Shabab instead of being the American face that's anti Shabab. The new Al Amriki is calling for foreign recruits, just like Omar did. But he's telling them they don't have to leave North America, they can fight for Al Shabab on home soil. If this kind of video raises the hackles of security watchdogs, it's also a deep concern for Somali Canadians who say Al-Shabaab's cause has nothing to do with Islam. Basically, Al-Shabaab or Al-Qaeda or whatever you call them, they hijack you know, our religion. So it's up to us to reclaim it. Protecting Canadian security and guarding the integrity of a religion. Clinton Watts says the war on terrorism isn't going to be a battle that's easily won. I think the other thing is this uh, notion that there was a defined victory in, in countering terrorism. We shouldn't be naive and think that there's a deliberate end to this. Uh, there will be people, you know, that are part of Al-Qaeda or whatever group Al-Qaeda becomes that will always want to attack the West. Next, the race to end all races. You're going to have to deal with this in a very primal way. 